So I would like to thank you all for waking up this morning and coming to my talk. On the walk over here, I almost wanted to skip my own talk because it's so wonderful outside. So thank you for coming here. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And I would like to uh, give a special thanks to the organizing committee. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's such a privilege to be on stage today and to share my journey into uh, open source and also working in data science and some of the projects that's tangential to both of those. So I have two questions to pose to the audience today. There'll be more, but these are the two that I'm gonna start with at least. Um, what does it mean to be human-centered? And how do we use data to empower, build, and grow? So I'll just let that percolate for like 30 seconds. And this is actually the questions that I use to anchor the talk that I'll be giving to you today. Okay, 30 seconds is long, <laughs> that was uncomfortable. Okay, so when I was first thinking about this talk, uh, I went through many iterations. One of the iterations was I was gonna give a journey through my PhD experience using all the allegories to Harry Potter books, and they're basically all the later books, like four through the end, because that's where things get dark, and that's pretty much from the beginning. But I wanted to spare everyone like that <laughs> uh, cathartic moment. I shouldn't use the stage just to like event on that. But what I would like to do is talk about some friction points in uh, science where it comes to doing um, analyses using tools, uh, being able to share your work, and I will walk you through some of the projects I've been involved with to help reduce that friction and at least make it easier for scientists to get involved, to contribute, and form communities around it. But before I do that, I would like to ask you another question. I told you there would be more than two. Um, is anyone familiar with the book that's on the screen? Great. So this is a human-centered data product. The, this product is called the Negro Motorist Green Book, also referred to as the Green Book. And it was a way for black travelers to navigate through Jim Crow in the US. It offered recommendations for restaurants that they'll feel welcome, places where they can get their hair cut or their hair done or their hair did. Um, it offered all of these opportunities and spaces where they will feel welcome and this product was centered on the human experience. So this is something that I think is very important when we think about what products we're building. How do we build for the users? We shouldn't just build tools because it's just like an engineering feat. We need to have it as a way of actually tackling issues that our users are facing. And this was a very important one. So a few data points about me. Uh, I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I went to UNC Chapel Hill, go Tar Heels. Any Tar Heel fans? Okay, yeah, go Tar Heels. Um, then I, uh, I studied linguistics and psychology, very interested in language and how the brain understands language. Went to graduate school for cognition and perception and then I did a postdoc essentially in plumbing data plumbing, and I'll talk about that a bit later in the talk. So here's some guideposts of some of the things I'm gonna cover in my talk today. First is just my journey into open source. Then we will talk about the view source for science, the tagline for iodide in the project that we're working on at Mozilla, and pyodide, which is a project that is an offshoot of an iodide to bring Python to the browser. Next, I will be uh, fanboying one of the projects that we have at Mozilla called Common Voice, and I'll talk about why it's important for free speech and open speech. And then I will wrap up the talk about CL, which is the Cognitive Innovation in Education Labs, and the Brainwaves Project, which is how we are empowering high school students from underserved backgrounds, uh, opportunities to do first-in-class research using high quality technology and providing access to course materials that most people in high schools just don't even have opportunities to. Okay, so first I'm gonna take you to the beginning of uh, my PhD journey. So I joined the research lab where there is this cookbook. If you just follow these steps, these recipes that are very opaque, you do it 
and you just hope to God that you can get a nature neuroscience paper out of it. <laughs> so I'm gonna walk you through some of the steps of like how this looked and why the tools that I end up contributing to really helps with demystifying this and actually offering transparency into the workflows of scientists. So I worked in MEG, which stands for magnetoencephalography. So we would measure the magnetic fields that come from the brain activity. Most people are familiar with EEG, where you measure the voltage on the scalp. So what we know from physics, or at least what I learned from physics that I kind of forgot about physics, but that every electrical current makes a magnetic field. And this magnetic field can be measured using SQUIDs, special quantum interference devices. Just a fancy way of saying magnetometers that can measure very minute magnetic field changes, FEM to Tesla. And I can't even give a reference to what FEM to Tesla is. It's just that it's really, 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 really small. Um, so we have this data that's coming from our studies where we would have, say, 157 channels that are covering the scalp. It's in a, a machine that looks like a toilet bowl. So you put your head in there, and we just read your brain activity. It's really cool. But it was developed, this, this hardware that we had was developed by a, uh, a very niche um, hardware company where they created their own data format and didn't share any of the data specifications and there was no way to really work with the data unless you were uh, familiar with their tools or you basically hacked it. So I essentially end up hacking it. Um, what we would need to do first would just like export all of the data into an ASCII text file. So imagine 1,000 hertz data, so 1,000 samples each second that you're recording somewhere for, say, 30 minutes or an hour, where you have 157 channels and then three reference channel and then 32 auxiliary channels. So the, the data are just growing in size and complexity and you're exporting to an ASCII file. So pour some out for the metadata that we lost <laughs> in this conversion. Um, so you would do all of this, takes about 45 minutes to get this file out because that's just how the software worked. Then you have to go to the bash, type in the command, and basically convert it to another data format, and that took around 30, 45 minutes itself. So you're spending like an hour and a half before you've ever seen the data. So this is how I spent the first year of my grad school. Just did it <laughs> because I wasn't a software engineer. I'm not a software engineer. I never claimed to be a software engineer. I had very small experience with uh, programming. It would be Perl. I learned a little Perl in my research assistantship that I had and I still don't even know what it does or <laughs> what I was doing. It was just like scripts that you just like edit and you're just like, oh, I think it works now. So that was my experience and I took a MATLAB class that I failed, well, I didn't fail, I got a C minus, but I did miserably in it <laughs> and I had to rotate a cow and that was like the project and I just never understood. The, the, the delivery of the course material was not in a way that was approachable for me being a linguist and a psychologist. It's like, it was just geared at, I don't even know the audience that was geared at. I don't even think computer scientists would actually appreciate it. So um, I asked over the listserv, what was, uh, did anyone have any experience with the hardware that we had? Uh, a few people did, um, and they were able to point me to some files that they've collected over the, the years. This tends to happen, you'll find like, say this one file that you just stored here, but it's never put in an open and uh, uh, an open place that anyone else can find reference to. So I'm pulling together all of these resources. One is telling me where the, the pointers to the file, um, the data within the files are, and how to read the data blocks and what type of sensors it is. And this is like my first approach into understanding programming. So the first approach that I had was this. You type some bash, say some incantations, you cross your fingers and pray to the .05 gods that you're going to get something that just squeeze out some significance, and then you hope that um, uh, the nature god shine down on you and may grace <laughs> your CV one day. So <laughs> I didn't really want to like buy into this system, so I tried some new approaches. So this is m and &E Python. 
So m and &E was first written in C by uh, one developer who is a physicist who wrote it. It works, but C is a really unapproachable language if you haven't been taught how to first like dive into it. You have to worry about memory allocation. You have to worry about a lot of things that modern um, interpreted languages really handles for you. And then I just like gifts. There will be some gifts throughout the talk, so I, I hope you enjoy them. Um, so wow, I, I didn't realize how small this was. But this is like my first commit for this project where I was trying to take the data from its native file format and read it into Mini Python, the software for data analysis, to remove the step of like having to go to an ASCII file, write bash, and then maybe get some interpretable data out of it. So the first commit, um, I wish I could read it to you, but I can't. But it goes to say, like, hey, this is like my first attempt. It's a work in progress. Uh, love feedback. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing, and that's essentially how it goes. Um, and then I actually went back and looked and saw that I left like really detailed comments in my uh, uh, commit message. And one thing that I would like to advocate to everyone is that remember your commits are a love letter from the past. So make sure you fill them with rich data so you understand why you did the steps that you did. So it, it started in January, I spent the month, this was over our winter break, and then I essentially got to a point where I'm like, hey, I think it works, it kind of works, it's doing what I expect. What are the tests that I need in order to make sure that's going on? I knew that tests were like something that is like useful in software, but I didn't know what they were. <laughs> it's like, so what is a unit test? Like how do I like make sure like the code is doing what I think it's doing? So. This was like my first approach into contributing to the open source project. And then there was this discussion, um, and then many more comments, and then many more commits, and then the frustration of trying to do a rebase <laughs> or <laughs> trying to merge in uh, comments that, uh, commits that say your fellow colleague would like to share with you. And this went on and on and on. And like it got to a point where the lead developer and I were on a phone call just to like walk through how to rebase my code because they had gone so awry. <laughs> um, then my first major PR by the numbers. I opened three separate pull requests because the first two were just like lost causes. <laughs> uh, I had a, it was around 104 commits, and most of them was like, discover PEP8. <laughs> now understand PEP8. <laughs> Still don't understand PEP8. And that just continued on until I, I started to understand what is the style and what it is to write Pythonic code. And I started learning a lot from the people who were part of this project. They really like helped contribute to like my understanding of how to create resources that would be shared and useful for others. And then, after 181 comments, uh, <laughs> I don't understand why software isn't just like peer review, <laughs> because they, I had to do a lot of work. <laughs> um, we, we, it finally got merged, and it was such a success. It was such a rush that I continue, and I still continue to contribute to this project. So what this led me to understand is, OK, we are using all of these desperate file formats and neuroimaging. How do I go from, say, collecting data in my experiment and sharing it with a colleague? There hasn't been any real efforts to really push this forward other than ones that labs would do for themselves and try to get other labs to just like buy in. There wasn't really a community effort behind it. So, the brain imaging data structure started as a project to standardize MRI data. So MRI stands for uh, magnetic resonance imaging. So it's what you get when you go to the hospital and say you tore your meniscus or they want to see if you had a stroke. They can put you in the machine and you can get these images that come from it. Um, so this was a way for the... Um, MRI researchers to standardize their data 
And then the MEG community saw so was like, oh, that would be very useful for us to also have. So um, I saw that there was like calls to participate in creating this data standard. And I had a lot of familiarity five years later with different formats. I had spent, uh, I had written a handful of other packages to convert their data as well. So this is really about like how do you take data from one person and connect it to another. It's the plumbing, it's the infrastructure, it's the, the thankless thing that you know it's necessary, but you get your hands dirty doing it. So this is just briefly to show you like a schematic that we had for how the data would be structured. And this is a way that software developers can really like write uh, the specification into their code to have the data come out in this nice and adopted way of sharing your data, which is really cool. So the m and &E team and the BITS team, they have both been working very hard to build commun community so scientists can collaborate. And this isn't easy. Like getting scientists to collaborate is like herding cats. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. There's also not the same incentive structure to really align with collaborating with say team science versus individual science. Everyone's fighting for that first author publication and where does that come when you have a team of 50? So this work has to be very intentional and it has to be very deliberate. This is just a photo of like a bunch of data nerds in uh, Montreal at the Neuroinformatics Conference. And then this is a coding sprint that I participated in recently uh, to help develop a better standards for m and &E. So special shout out to Chris Hallgraf and to Dan McCloy because they've done a lot of great work in just like uh, building out the documentation, creating tutorials, really getting to a point where like new contributors can come and use the software and feel welcome. We have a code of conduct. We have all of these new tools that have been put in place to really like help our project really grow and really benefit the whole community. So uh, I really thank the entire team for all the work they've been doing and we know that there's much, much more work to be done. Next up is um, a project that I've been contributing to. Uh, I make my first like, PRs just like a month ago, but I've been using it since they've been working on it for the past year, and it's called Iodide. So Iodide, why Iodide? Why the name Iodide? So one, it has high recognizability. You can say iodide and people are like, oh yeah, I, I can remember iodide. And it has low confusability, so you don't say have a package named Go and try to search for Go <laughs> in Google search. It's really hard to like get up to the top when you're competing with a lot of like other recognized uh, words. So we're optimizing for search and it's kind of cool. It's, uh, it's like a, a shout out to the science community, especially the chemistry, the fact that we are trying to do what we call have the view source for science. You're able to see how reports are being created by both having the narrative and the code nicely blended together. And I'll walk you through it. I promise you more gifts. <laughs> we have more gifts. <laughs> uh, so what are we looking at here? So these are just like some of the notebooks that we've created with Iodide that allows for you to just really use the web browser as a rendering engine for all your wild dreams for data science, which is really neat. We're able to build on top of uh, all of the web technologies in order to bring an ecosystem that's very friendly for sharing among your colleagues. So what we want to do, we want to tell compelling and expressive stories, and you're able to do that using these technologies. The web has been that platform and that rendering engine for all the content that we normally consume on a daily basis now. So you have the benefit of that, and it's native to the web. 
You can think of it as if you read the New York Times, the upshot, you see all of these very cool graphics and you would love to know how they made it, but you can't. <laughs> uh, so this is offering an opportunity to see like, what is the code that built that really neat graph? So um, these are some examples of using WebGL and the browser. The one in the middle is the Lorenz attractor, and then the one on the right is all of the eviction data in San Francisco. So we can actually pull from open, uh, open data portals and have it import right into your native space, and you can build visualizations from it. So I had eyed at a glance. If you hit the explore button, you're able to see both the code that created it, as well as the narrative that goes along with it. So what we have here are code chunks that are delimited, so you can have markdown, and where you can have all the LaTeX that you wanna add, all those equations that you can have to like, really go well with. You can have here, as well as JavaScript, that's ways of importing very cool um, libraries to do charting and other infographics. So, why JavaScript? JavaScript is native to the web. Um, but we also wanted to expand what the capabilities of this notebook were. So this is where PyDI comes into play. And I'll give a, a slide in just a moment about it. But the idea behind PyDI is that we can take the Python stack, the C Python implementation, and we can now compile it using WebAssembly. It's just really cool. It's new technology that has been adopted by major browsers for rendering native compiled code on the web, which is really neat. This goes into um, this exploration and explanation uh, that was highlighted in Adam Rule's paper where you see computational notebooks taking a new life and both being a way to express research that you're doing, also ways to explore that research, and also to ask other questions of that research. So we're borrowing a lot of ideas with iodide from established projects, and we love them all the same as well. We take from our studio, and we take from Jupyter Lab, and we're really just trying to create another way of sharing content um, and addressing our needs at Mozilla. So one of the things that we had as a, a pain point at Mozilla is that we normally work with like large and large and large amounts of data. So what we tend to do, we use uh, distributed computing tools such as Spark or PySpark, which is the Python implementation of Spark, where we can pull this data into a data cube that is much more manageable. So we do our data wrangling and aggregation, and we're like, okay, what is the analysis that we want to tell with this? What we have done in the past is either export to, well, very early on we would export to Google Docs. You make your figures, you write your narrative, and this is what you can share with a product manager or other stakeholders. But a lot is lost in doing that. You no longer have the source for what you're creating, and you no longer have um, any of the context for how that figure was created. So we wanted to be able to bundle both the code that rendered those uh, images or those graphs and have all the data to come along with it. And this is what we can now bundle with HTML. You can just package it all together and you can ship it. And that's our idea of sharing data at our company. So as I mentioned, PyDide is this new tool which is for implementing Python in the browser, and it comes with uh, three of the major packages as well, as, as well as just like the native Python packages. You have NumPy, you have Pandas, you have Matplotlib uh, that are working just fine. Um, it's using WebAssembly to compile it. You basically fetch, and you can have like this entire Python environment brought into your browser. And with this, you also have the opportunity of using all of the web APIs that go along with anything that you do in the web framework. So this is really cool. If you, say, want to plot a matplotlib figure on your website, you can now import the document 
and then say document get that ID, and then you can just say here's my matplotlib figure, and it will render and have the full expressiveness of say uh, a TK output of the the plot that you will see in um, a native like Python environment. It's really 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 neat, and uh, we uh, take from uh, take inspiration from prior work and related work of like. PyPyJS or zero dependency Python and Python, which are other implementations. And this is what we're doing is just taking the native C code and using WebAssembly so that there's uh, a, a clear provenance in how the work is being done. No transpiling. This is actually native C Python code running in the browser, which is pretty neat. So we also have some experimental packages that we're working on. Uh, so we have support, uh, uh, experimental support for SciPy. You can also use scikit-learn in the browser. And we have support for uh, some parts of the Fortran packages. This is like Fortran 77. And if you wanted to use like more modern Fortran, like Fortran 95, we really don't have that support right now. Um, but the, the reason that we're interested in Fortran is not because we really want to bring Fortran to the, the, to the web, it's that we want to bring R to the web. And it, being able to bring R to the web will allow for all of those same um, nice tidyverse implementations of your workflow to be able to be imported into this space. So this is really neat, and we actually have a call for proposals out right now. So if you know anyone who's really big into compilers, or if you're really big into compilers, you can apply for this grant. I think I, I put a slide up here. Uh, these, this, these, this slide that will be shared uh, after the talk. So uh, feel free to check it out. Uh, we're taking calls up to, until the 31st. And we also have eight other projects that you can also apply. So maybe compilers aren't your, your jazz. Uh, there are other things that you can also apply for. So with, with this, uh, Iodide is, uh, is building, the Iodide project is building tools to allow for you to tell stories that are comp in a compelling in a very interactive way. And this is just one way that we're approaching at Mozilla how we can share the reports that we're doing. And we'll be talking much uh, in, in the near future. I'm working on a project to bring a data science blog for Mozilla. So we will have a way to communicate with our users, share the reports, and be fully transparent with the types of things that we're using um, uh, to make our decisions. We are only data stewards of the data that you allow for us to use. And we want to show how we're using it and how we're informing products. And this will be one way that we can uh, share the reports that we have done in order to make better decisions on your behalf. So try it out. Feedback is welcome. Contribute. Uh, you can check out these links. Uh, it's a neat project. And we would love to collaborate with other projects and really like figure out how can we develop synergy across like all of these other projects, doing similar things and figure out where we can converge and work together. So another project that we're working on at Mozilla is called the Common Voice Project. I'm not directly involved with this, but I am such a fanboy of it. Uh, uh, the idea behind hey, all of these slides for, uh, for the Common Voice have been uh, uh, given to me from our open innovation team. So you can thank them for these like beautiful illustrations. I really wish I had that design capability. Um, uh, but the idea behind Common Voice is that we're trying to allow users to contribute to an open data set that is privacy protecting, done in an ethical way, and that can be shared freely. We also would like to build community around this project so that we can build uh, data sets for the communities that we aim to serve. So why free speech? <laughs> so this is a, a, a market segmentation of like uh, voice assistant products that are being used in the US. And what we see um, is that there's an estimated 35% per year growth 
from now until 2024, and the use of voice assistants. So, hey Siri, hey Google, hey Alexa, these are the ways that we've been interacting in the world, and it's becoming a much more intuitive way for us to interact with the technology um, that we use on a daily basis. But what's happening? We actually see that even though we have such a huge growth in the uptake of voice assistants, it's being consolidated among just a handful of uh, uh, companies which doesn't really provide data to the public uh, to build their own work. And we think that this is stifling innovation. So we, as Mozilla, like to be rubble rousers. We like to disturb the market. Our idea is that if we are able to build community and crowdsource and do it in ethical and safe ways, how can we build tools that can compete against these really, really, really big giants in a ways that empower the contributors and the developers to create tools using open data. So the main ingredients behind this is that, cool. uh, the main ingredients we have behind this is the Project Common Voice. Uh, what Common Voice does is that we take CCO data of like written text, and we ask our users, would you read this text and donate your voice samples to a collective? So the idea, you go to a website, you read uh, the token sentence, and then you submit it if you would like to contribute. This is really cool. This is a way that we can amass the thousands and thousands of hours you need to actually make a very uh, human-like uh, voice recognition software. So, all of this data is publicly accessible. We are the second largest public accessible data set. I think we may have become the first, but don't quote me on that. Uh, but we have really amassed a lot of data from our contributors in ways that we are able to build a voice recognition model for English that is at around 95% uh, human-like, which means that it gives an error around 5% of the time, and this is expected uh, um, in terms of like the performance given our data set size. So the collection of the data is common voice, and the model that we're using is part of the project Deep Speech. So Deep Speech is creating um, a voice recognition model that we will actually publicly share with the users, taking the data from Common Voice as input and then model as output. It's all in the Git repository, so if you would like to check it out, see how it works, offer some suggestions to fine tuning the model, you're more than welcome to do so and you're more than, uh, you're more than welcome to join the project. So the idea behind Common Voice is part of Mo Mozilla's initiative to teach machines how real people talk. I mentioned English, but what this project is also doing is tapping all of the communities around the world, Spanish, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, French, all of the languages that you would like. What we will do is help you find data sets that are openly licensed, so that we can use, uh, and then allow for you to use the platform where all the data is accessible to you and your community, and it's creating this way for you to crowdsource among your community and really have uh, the, the opportunity to empower and really uh, grow this project. So Common Voice connects the dots at Mozilla uh, around our mission, around privacy, diversity, and creating a community um, to speech space. It's pretty neat. And Common Voice empowers our contributors to build open voice data sets for their community. 
The last project I would like to talk about is CL, or the Cognitive Innovations in Education Labs. So CL is newly formed um, as of like the past three months, and there are three of us who are working very, very hard to get it off the ground and really reach out to schools in the New York City area, and I'll tell you a bit more in the next slide. So our mission as a nonprofit we have the aim to deliver high quality, low cost, hands-on, real research experience to underserved communities and underrepresented communities. So I'll give you some inspiration for, some pro for why we did this project. I taught a workshop in uh, Thailand with a colleague of mine from undergrad, uh, Pia, who is a Fulbright scholar, and we had this idea of blending engineering education and cognitive science education in a way that's very hands-on, fun, and engaging. So we called it DIY Cognitive Sci. And the idea is that we created two research uh, devices. One was uh, eye tracker, an eye tracker that we use um, a PlayStation Eye. We got really cheap cameras and we were able to tear it apart and retrofit it to our needs. Um, and then we also 3D printed um, a headset so that we can um, install an open source EEG microcontroller so that we can record brain activity and show students their brain activity for the first time. So it was really neat. We were taking like off the shelf parts and low cost equipment and access to 3D printer and putting all of these parts together to teach both how we're building the research equipment and how this research equipment can be used in order to answer questions that we might have. And we focused on cognitive science because I'm a cognitive scientist and I really am interested in how people think, perceive, and act in the world. And it's a very good way for uh, teaching uh, students how they can think uh, about the world in uh, a very grounded, empirical way. What came out of this was another project called Open Experiment, which is branded Brainwaves. Uh, Brainwaves is a project that we received the NIH grant for, so we have five years of funding to teach uh, neuroscience education to high school, school, uh, high school students in New York City. So the first and fifth years for, I mean, for development and implementation, um, and then for evaluation, and then two, three, and four is for classroom implementation. So first year for development, two, three, four for implementation, fifth for evaluation. I kind of stumbled on that. Um, and the idea behind it is that we are creating an all-in-one application that allows for the student to connect to their hardware, see the data that is streaming in, run a psychology experiment, a cognitive neuroscience experiment. Once you throw the brain in, it becomes a neuroscience experiment. And then uh, they're able to analyze the data and then write a report based on the data. And this is all built around web technologies that pull from open source projects that I've contributed to over the time. So this has been my way to stitch together, say, my m and &E contributions and my JSI contributions and the other open source projects and really bring in those communities in a way that we can all like build toward making an app that will be used for teaching in high school, that can be taught in colleges, and taught in many other places, where you really want to give a hands-on experience for research methods. So, uh, this is, you can actually go to our GitHub and like download it and check it out if you're interested. And you can also uh, send us issues and file pull requests if you're really daring. <laughs> uh, but what we have now, we, ha we uh, have a way of visualizing the brain data, and then we can run this faces versus houses experiment, and we are able to time lock the brain activity that's coming in with the screen presentation, so the students are starting to understand how we tackle these issues in the lab for trying to make inferences 
on what we see and how the brain responds to it. We also do a professional development training where we train our teachers. So our approach is that we work with teachers because they're experts in teaching and we are providing uh, domain expertise in cognitive neuroscience. So we are uh, doing a lot of lateral transfer of uh, knowledge. So we come in as partners. And with this, we are able to uh, do a unit where we do sheep brain dissections, which is really cool. And the students actually get to dissect sheep brains. And then we run through a host of other experiments in our first unit. And then in the second unit, they get to use the Brainways app where they're developing their own experiment and run it in, on the classmates. And uh, it's a really great way for them to engage in the scientific method. It puts them in the driver's seat and it gives them opportunities to really explore what it is to be a scientist and really have like true grounding and what goes on and all of the textbooks that they read, they have like some idea how the information got there. And our target demographic is that we're working with Title I schools in New York City, so that means that half the student population is on free or reduced lunch, and it tends to be disproportionately uh, uh, people of color, uh, the kids. Um, so we're really trying to tackle the intersection of both the underserved community, the underrepresented community, and those who lie at the intersection of both. So CL and Brainways, they both help foster growth in hands-on experiments and data collection. And this has been my way of navigating through both the projects that I've contributed to, to the work that I'm doing now at Mozilla, and then also work that I'm doing in the community in ways that we can really like center people in the way that we uh, create data tools and ways that we approach um, looking at the world around us. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and then I'm open for questions.